Hello, everyone. Because I'm coming from a very different uh, discipline and different area than uh, the others who have spoken to you, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself and why I'm here uh, and why I'm speaking to you. Um, I have been a reporter, a journalist, for quite a few decades. I've written some books. Um, I have a website uh, for NASA. And also, I was asked to come here to ELSI to write uh, what I think is a really fascinating story, which is kind of the origins of a very unique institution. So in that sense, just as these wonderful scientists have been talking about origins, I'm here to also talk about origins, but of a very different kind. So this is me uh, uh, some time ago in Afghanistan, where I was a reporter for quite a while. I was a foreign correspondent and did a lot of uh, going around the world and collecting facts and bringing them back, trying to understand, trying to understand what people were telling me, what their cultures were really saying. Sometimes it was just what I saw. Um, that was important. Uh, and then I would write them as stories and send them back to the public. Um, and this was wonderful to do, um, you know, to have this kind of wild kind of experience. Um, but about 15 years ago, I started writing about science, particularly about space, but also about science generally. Uh, and fairly quickly, I came to the conclusion that many of the scientists and journalists share a very similar way of looking at the world. We go out, we collect information. We do experiments of a sort. Uh, our job is to then try to make sense of that information that we've gotten, to write it into papers or into articles, uh, and to then share it with the world. So it's been both an enormous pleasure and an honor for me to be part of that process for scientists uh, who have their story to tell, and I then am part of that storytelling. So with that preface, uh, I was asked to come here to ELSI, uh, and I want to give you a sense of what a unique organization this is and what a unique place this is. Just as a little bit of history, this was uh, the, the whole ELSI idea uh, and, and the campus came as a result of the world premier international research center initiative by the government of Japan. Um, it, it gave out a huge amount of money to uh, now I think it's 11 different institutes um, with the goal of kind of jump-starting um, Japanese science. This is the way it was explained to me that there was perceived maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, to be something of a crisis in Japanese science. I don't know that this is true, but this is the origin of the WPI uh, and of this initiative. Um, LC was one of the later institutes. Uh, it, it came on board only in, in 2012. Um, but it has had what I believe is just an utterly remarkable history and, and rise. Um, if you had been here two years ago, there would be no building here, or there would be a construction site. Uh, if you were here five years ago, you could not find a researcher because they were stuck into kind of cubby holes in the back. Um, there were no labs. Uh, now you have, this is by no means all of the people of ELSI, but you have a population here, a very thriving population of scientists, uh, of technicians, uh, of uh, incredibly talented administrative staff that keeps a very complicated system going. And if I might also, at this point, give a brief 
shout out, as we say in the US, to my photographer colleague, Nerissa, right there, uh, <laughs> who, has, who has taken the pictures here uh, and uh, is terrific. And as a further explanation of what we are doing, we're going to be writing online columns for the, and, and having photographs for the LC website, but also um, just because we were uh, gluttons for punishment, we decided we would try to put together a long narrative into, uh, of the history and the people and the science of Elsie into a kind of a book, mini book, and to have it available for the symposium in January. If any of you have been involved in book writing and publishing, you know that is insane, but that's what we're going to do. In any case, so this was at a, uh, an Eon um, gathering. Uh, virtually all of the uh, ELSI-related gatherings start with some kind of photograph like this, where they get everyone together to show that, yes, we exist. Uh, and uh, you'll see that there is a wide uh, distribution of people. Um, the WPI, one of its reasons for being was to bring international scientists to Japan. That was the goal. Um, here at ELSI, more than I think any institute other than one other, uh, they have succeeded well. Uh, they have roughly 60 scientists, uh, about half of them are international. Uh, the goal also is to uh, be gender balanced. They're not doing quite as well there, but they're trying. <laughs> With the entire staff, we have more than 100 people. But what makes ELSI unique, in addition to the beginnings of what I've told you, is that every week there are people from around the world coming here. Uh, for conferences, for workshops, to just collaborate with each other. Um, there, there was money made available to do something right here in Ookayama um, that is not done anywhere else in the world. Kei Hiroshi uh, is the director. Uh, Pete Hutt is um, the, a counselor. Um, the two of them were among the handful of people who were responsible for uh, the idea that was brought before the WPI that then became ELSI. Uh, uh, Kei Hiroshi is a renowned scientist, um, uh, world-renowned. World uh, he has done um, uh, really pioneering work on deep Earth um, observations. Uh, and he has, and, and simulations, and he is using uh, various technologies, some of which he has developed, uh, has broken a lot of new ground in terms of understanding the core of, of our Earth, how the core evolves. That's what he tells me he, is his lifetime goal, is to understand better what it's composed of and how it evolves. But already he's done more work than most anyone. Um, and he was here at Tokyo Tech. Uh, Pete is a extremely unusual person. Um, he is brilliant also. Uh, he was the, the youngest professor ever to be hired at the um, Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton, which is the place made famous by taking in Albert Einstein. Uh, so it took in Albert Einstein, and then it took in Pete. Uh, 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 he is very unconventional thinking. Um, it, he, his background is as an astrophysicist, uh, working with dense stellar systems. I don't really know what that is, but um, I'm sure it's very important. Uh, and uh, But after only maybe a decade or so at IAS, he got interested in philosophy, in paleontology, in mathematics, uh, and he just has the kind of mind that uh, you know cannot be hemmed in, cannot be bordered. Uh, and so uh, he 
and he knows virtually everyone in the world. I mean, he has a connection to everyone. Uh, and if he doesn't now, he will soon. Uh, and he was responsible for bringing an awful lot of people to Elsie. Kay was responsible for attracting a lot of people to Elsie because of his great scientific background. His, but you have two men there uh, with terrific pedigrees, uh, and that's part of how and why this place has prospered. Um, it also is a place that, uh, again, by WPI um, uh, priority, uh, is all about collaboration. Um, many scientists, um, and I was told here that this, this was particularly the case in Japan, um, focus very, very, very well on their subject. And they go very deeply into the subject and often come up with important discoveries. But science tends to be going now in the direction of people collaborating together, uh, bringing together different disciplines um, so that uh, you know, a, a, a microbiologist might have things that they could add to what a geochemist or a, even a physicist is saying and put it together and you have a lot more understanding than you might have with just one person doing that in one field. Um, so just about any time you come to ELSI um, during the workday, there are people meeting like this, uh, pouring over data. Uh, it's kind of exhilarating to watch. Um, so many grown-ups being that excited about these things. Uh, and um, there you go. One of the things about LC also is, is that it's not the people here are not afraid to have fun. Um, this, uh, this is Arena uh, Mamajanov, who's one of the PIs here. And uh, she is doing really, really cutting edge work in, in, I don't know what it would be called, systems, biology, chemistry. Um, she, uh, I think both Jim and Sean were talking to some extent about different theories about how life began. Uh, and she, working uh, uh, with other people and then also on, you know, with the experience that other people have had, but she has really moved forward with the idea of messy chemistry, thus the name, messy chemistry. Um, there famously was an experiment done in 1952, the Miller-Urey experiment. It was um, the, one of the first times that gases believed at that point to have been present on Earth uh, back in the early Earth time, along with some water, were charged with uh, electricity. And lo and behold, some hours later, they found, well, what they found was a beaker full of gunk. Uh, That's called, basically called tar. But then they, they worked with it and they found amino acids, which are, and I think nucleotides, which are very important precursors to, to life or to, you know, building blocks for life. Um, and the tar that was around the beaker was always considered to be like, hmm, a problem. You know, a, a, a lot of chemists, or artificial or, or synthetic chemists will talk about, you know, how they did this experiment or that experiment and they got tar at the end and it was like, oh, that's terrible. She says, Tar, that's great. Um, it's, um, it, it's a kind of a new way of looking at chemistry, and it's very complicated. Uh, and there is no, as there is with any of these fields, uh, there's no sure um, sense that it will bear fruit, but it seems to be. It seems to be productive. And it's one of the things that Elsie is now known for. Um, I was at a conference in, in Arizona a, a large international conference on uh, origin uh, on uh, astrobiology, and Arena, not wearing the shirt, um, was one of the uh, main speakers at one of the one of the plenaries. So uh, this is just my way of saying that um, that Elsie, in a very very short time, 
when all things is considered, especially since other people have been talking about billions of years. This is, you know, a couple of years. Uh, the origins here, they're creating something that really has interesting roots and, and fruit already. Ichiro uh, Ueno uh, is one of the, um, I, I think he was here at the beginning of LC. He's also a professor at Tokyo Tech. He uh, has collaborated with many, many people here. Again, collaboration is the name of the game. Uh, and uh, he is a, now a geobiochemist. Um, I think he started off as a geologist, but gradually did more and more things, and so he became a geobiochemist. Um, and one of the important things that he did about 10, 15 years ago, uh, he was down in uh, the Pilbara section of Australia, which is known for uh, to have some of the most ancient rocks uh, on Earth. And uh, he and, and the team that he was with, you know, were chopping, chopping, and they took away, uh, you know, tons or, in any case, many samples of, uh, uh, of rock. And uh, I, because of how and where this rock was deposited, uh, uh, Ueno thought that this could be a really interesting sample. And so they did the, what are, what are called the thin, thin slices, thin cuts of the rock, um, and this, as it turns out, is a bubble of methane that was in a rock that was 3.4 billion years old, uh, which meant that um, you, know, you, you had uh, either methane in the atmosphere or perhaps some creature creating methane. I mean, because that happened a great deal at that point. Uh, but this was a discovery or... or, or an experiment, a process that uh, got a lot of attention, got a, a major nature uh, journal article. Um, and all right, that was sitting there. It turns out that, that uh, Ueno is also the director of a rock library. You probably didn't know that there is a wonderful, large rock library here on campus, one of the biggest in the world. Um, and they have samples from most of the significant um, early, early Earth sites. Um, and then, because this is Elsie, and Sean, I'm sorry about the wide angle there. I mean, it, <laughs> you could blame Narissa. Um, <laughs> but but um, uh, Utro and Sean have been collaborating together using that sample uh, uh, Sean wants to, and he could no doubt explain it better, but uh, he's, he's using it to examine uh, sulfur, sul uh, sulfur isotopes going way, way back and trying to find a, a process by which you can, you can date and you, can, and you could watch the evolution of potentially microscopic life in the rock by looking at the sulfur isotopes. Is that half right, Sean? Half right. <laughs> OK. I succeeded. But in any case, <laughs> uh, uh, um, it'll be right by the time I write it. Um, uh, but it, it, is, it, it is that collaboration is an example of what LC is all about, is to take knowledge from one set of, of scientists put it together with others. Uh, this is hot magma, hot magma. Uh, when, when, uh, when I was told that another initiative here is the magma ocean, I thought, that is so cool. I mean, I was not aware that there had been a magma ocean, but uh, <laughs> that was my uh, lack of knowledge. But at the very uh, earliest times of Earth's uh, history, um, Hot molten rock covered much of the globe, uh, and 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 perhaps went way deep. Uh, and how it, how the dynamics of that and the the heat and the composition of that are a subject of a great deal of study, particularly here at Elsie. Magma ocean is also another priority here, um, and 
uh, working with Kay and John Herland and others, um, they have, they've been making a lot of progress about what the magma ocean on Earth might have been like, and then also what the implications of that could be. Uh, also working on this is uh, Keiko Hamano, who I think you had the pleasure of hearing from this morning. Um, she also had a paper in Nature um, a couple years ago, maybe, uh, where she was talking about the magma ocean and extrapolating uh, from the knowledge that we have of how the magma ocean on Venus might have made that planet into the, you know, the, the hot cauldron that it is. Uh, and she's saying that it's possible that the magma ocean there, instead of lasting millions of years, could have lasted 3.5 billion years. Um, and again, thus making it what it is. The, um, several years ago, there was a perception here that they needed more scientists uh, to, be, uh, to be here, to kind of get the juices going. Um, Pete Hutt uh, was instrumental in getting a, uh, um, a grant from the Templeton Foundation. Uh, several of the people who spoke today are part of the EON program, LC Origins Network program. Uh, it brings people, I think it started as 10, now it's maybe up to 13, uh, scientists from around the world. Um, they kind of have these schizophrenic lives where they spend six months here and six months back from, you know, back at where uh, they are from. Uh, and it has been just an enormous success in terms of uh, spreading the word about LC, but also bringing in a great deal of collaboration. Uh, and uh, I will leave this to Nicholas to talk about how there is a lot of computational uh, work that's going on here. Um, uh, like the messy chemistry I was referring to, that has a, a, a computational side to it that is really interesting. Origin of Life, I, I was just looking uh, online and saw that there were a million plus hits for just this. Uh, the origin of life hasn't necessarily been like a hot subject uh, in the past, but I think its time is coming, I hope. Uh, and uh, Elizabeth was talking about exoplanets. Uh, you should also just know that part of the LC mission of understanding the origin of the Earth and the origin of life is also trying to understand aspects of exoplanet origins and potential life. So it's quite broad. And I'll end on this. Um, the Hayabusa mission uh, was really a remarkable experience and success. Uh, and I, I don't exactly know how to describe this or how to explain this, but it, it, it's something that is little known in the United States, um, both the incredible ingenuity that the that the engineers used, and then also the fact that they actually brought back dust grains, and that there's a second uh, Hayabusa that's going to a different asteroid. Um, and this brings me to kind of my final thought about Elsie and for the students among you. Um, this is totally unfair, but the world of science is largely done in English. Totally unfair. Why is Hayabusa not known much in the United States and elsewhere? Because most of the coverage was in Japanese. I apologize for that, but that's the way it is. And one of the things that LC mandates is that everything be done in English. And that's almost the case. Um, so for, the, for any of you who are students and are interested in going into these kinds of fields, study as well as your chemistry, study your English your spoken English. Thank you.